517, the Domestic Partnership Benefits and Obligation Act of 2009. H.R. 2517 provides that same-sex domestic partners of federal employees will be entitled to the same benefits available to a married federal employee and his or her spouse. I'd like to thank my colleagues, uh, Representative Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin and Representative Ileana ross Leighton of, of Florida on July 8, who are the lead sponsors of this, this bill. Uh, on July 8, the subcommittee held a hearing on the legislation before us today. At that hearing, we heard from several witnesses who voiced their support for this bill, including the U.S. The U.S. Office of Personnel Management, Director John Berry. We also heard from both public and private employers on the merits and potential obstacles of providing these benefits. Although every detail involving implementation of these benefits has not been completed, uh, this subcommittee has all the information it needs to proceed with reporting this legislation and correcting the inequality that it currently exists for federal employees and their domestic partners. With consideration of H.R. 2517, the real issue that we are tackling today involves principles of equality, fairness, and inclusion in the workplace, principles that should be commonplace for the federal government as an employer, both in theory and in practice. However, neither exists currently. Many federal employees and their same-sex partners continue to be denied access to employee benefits, such as health insurance or retirement savings, which are customarily offered to employees with opposite-sex spouses. As a leader in employee rights and benefits, the federal government needs to catch up to numerous public and private sector employers whom already have extended domestic partner benefits. The passage of H.R. 2517 will also demonstrate that the federal government stands by the concept of equal pay for equal work. The bottom line is that the passage of this bill before us is simply the right thing to do. Aside from the basic concepts of fairness and non-discrimination, the need to provide domestic partnership benefits to federal employees should also be evaluated in light of the potential positive impact such policies can have on the federal government's recruitment and retention capabilities, employee productivity and morale. As the recent hearing demonstrated, we have let a tremendous amount of talent walk away from federal employment and seek jobs from private employers who offer these valuable benefits. This legislation is being reported in order for the federal government to continue its leadership and support of equality and inclusion. I'd again like to thank the lead sponsors from Wisconsin and Florida, Congresswoman Tammy Baldwin and Ileana ross Leighton, as well as the 115 co-sponsors of H.R. 2517 for their work, diligence, and commitment I thank the subcommittee members for their participation and attendance this morning, and I hope you will join me in supporting the bill, as well as the amendment I intend to offer later. I now yield to our ranking member, the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for his opening comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'd like to uh, actually, if we could, recognize Mr. Souter first, and, and then I'd go after him. Of course. Yes. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, and I'd like to uh, read a statement that I put together, and it's, it's a very difficult subject, and I appreciate the difficulty of this subject for uh, many of us today. Um, and I thank the chairman. In today's society, the biggest faux pas that one c commit is seemingly not to be tolerant. To condemn is to judge, which is mean, harsh, nasty, and uncivilized. So we seemingly can't have moral disagreements anymore on homosexual rights, abortion, prostitution, illegal drug use, gambling. We should be allowed to do our own thing. Back when Bill Clinton was president, I was live on BBC's highest raised newscast after the Monica incident. I was asked, why are Americans so upset that the president dropped his pants for an intern? Why are Americans so moralistic that he feeds, feels he needs to keep apologizing, they ask. Similarly, why do Governor Sanford, Senators Ensign and Vitter, and others feel compelled to apologize, especially in a country with around a 50% divorce rate and many more have affairs? It is safe to say that as a nation, we have some gaps between what we say and what we do. I believe that every person is a sinner, so I do not believe that I or others should go around condemning others when we disagree. We can state our disagreements, but we need to watch our tone. I do not pretend to be perfect. None of us are. Most Americans still believe in the basic Judeo-Christian values as a goal, if not always the reality. Thus, while most of us have homosexual friends and many have family, the majority, even in California, believe that marriage should be between one man and one woman. 
the fundamental debate behind today's vote is whether, as a society, we still agree that marriage and the legal benefits derived from marriage should be reserved only for traditional families. If we give the same tax benefits and even fund benefits with taxpayer dollars for partners or whoever the committed other is, then we have taken away the concept of a traditional marriage. It becomes irrelevant. I and most Americans are offended at gay bashing and appalled by violence against homosexuals. We can strongly disagree without mistreating each other. I maintain that while Americans want us to be personally more tolerant and less condemning of others, they still want to uphold basic moral ideas of the traditional one man, one woman family. Today's vote is a difficult reconciliation. If there is a gay couple who has been together for 20 years, why shouldn't the partner get health benefits? On the one hand, it just seems fair. But the real question is much harder and challenges our fundamental beliefs. Do we believe in continuing the moral ideal of a traditional marriage in America? Or have we gone so far that even now we are abandoning that as official position of our society and its laws? This Congress and the President are steadily eroding away our traditional moral standards, the fundamental moral goals of a society in the name of fairness. I understand why, but I do not agree. It is bad enough in my mind that we fail to achieve our moral goals as we have seen so much in the recent uh, news. But it is worse to be abandoning moral hazard even as a guiding principle. Right now it seems that this government is doing it in almost every piece of legislation, whether it's in, in financing or it's in narcotics or in this case in uh, traditional definition of marriage. I am against taxpayer funding of these benefits because it is totally inconsistent with the belief that marriage should be one man and one woman and alters the long-held position of our society. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, does any other member wish to be heard on this matter? The chair recognizes the ranking member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, and I appreciate this, uh, this opportunity. My, my, my comments will be brief. I simply believe in the traditional view of marriage, and I stand tall on that. I make no apologies for the idea that I believe that marriage should be defined as between one man and one woman. I am not supportive of trying to redefine marriage or try to provide uh, uh, something uh, that will a a appease uh, uh, someone else. Uh, I do not believe we should try to redefine marriage, and therefore I am very unsupportive of this bill as it's uh, presently uh, uh, written. Uh, I believe it is uh, unconstitutional. I think it is fraught with problems. I think it will create a whole host of other unintended consequences along the way, and I will not be supportive of it. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Chairman. Does any other member wish to be heard? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. I speak in support of the bill. Um, I understand the concerns that uh, members have who oppose it who have a, a traditional view of marriage. I mean, I'm married. I'm married to a woman, and I kind of like it. Okay? But I also understand that when you're talking about love, if two people love each other, then in a sense, there are times that sexuality can just kind of dissolve as a, as a factor. And I think that as we evolve as human beings, and as we evolve as a country, uh, I'm, I think w there's a potential that we'll have a more compassionate view of, the, um, of human love and, and that our institutions will follow that, that understanding. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Northern Virginia, Mr. Conley. I thank the chair. Just briefly, Mr. Chairman, I, I understand the uh, discomfort of our colleague um, about the subject matter and about the intent of this bill. I, I'm in support of the legislation because I don't think this is about the personal moral views of members of Congress. Uh, this is about equity and fairness in the federal workplace. This is about making sure that no class of human beings based on their beliefs, their lifestyle, their orientation is discriminated against in the federal workforce. And this Congress needs to be heard loud and clear that we will not countenance discrimination in any form for any reason against any person or class of persons. That's what this legislation is about and that's why I support the bill, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. 
Chair recognizes the gentlelady from Washington, D.C., Ms. Uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, uh, the, the rapid uh, proceeding to markup of this bill following our hearing. I was pleased to be a co sponsor of this bill. I recall that um, for several sessions, this uh, subcommittee saw even the paltry um, uh, executive order that was on the books not being enforced. So we are squarely facing this issue. In fact, and frankly, we're following, we're followers on facing this issue, but we're facing straight on another issue of discrimination. And there's no way to avoid what we've been doing. We've been scrim discriminating against uh, employees of the federal government based on their sexual orientation doing the same job as other couples and not getting the same benefits. Uh, we are way behind Fortune 500 companies. We are way behind the country. Wake up. The country has changed on these issues. Congress is following, not leading. I'm pleased to see that this subcommittee is stepping forward and pressing this issue to its worthy conclusion. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Bill Bray. Yes, Mr. Chairman. I uh, have to apologize. I'm a, once a history major, always a history major. And uh, I just think that we need to remember uh, maybe the, the, the sad issue here, and I'll say this as somebody who strongly supported um, domestic partnerships when I served in California. I hate to see the way that support has been manipulated in the recent past. Uh, but why is the government, you know, we've gotten in the situation of why was the government even providing these benefits ever to somebody who is r related or associated with an employee? And, you know, we forget what all of these institutions or all these arrangements were for, and I hate to say it, but the, the, um, the issue of marriage has been tagged on with the gay community when in fact this thing goes a lot deeper, the fact the total devaluation of the concept of family and the broadening of that definition of family um, uh, you know, ignores the point that the only reason why we provided these benefits before is because there was a unit in society where one person stayed at home or didn't, was not fully employed because there was a requirement within that unit that somebody be present to raise the children. Now, I know this is a dirty word to bring up, but this whole thing is not about couples. It's about the reason why the government or got into treating somebody who was associated a certain way was because that person was part of a team that was raising children and there was a social benefit of having that unit together raising those children. I think we've all seen what happens when the concept that a, a couple raising um, of children is not, doesn't matter anymore. We've seen the social, economic, and cultural problems created by denying the importance of two people working together to raise a family. And I think we totally forget this is not about love, this is not about sexual orientation, this is not about couples. This was originally de developed and has always been aimed at children and at families and the family unit was not a couple, it was to help would, make sure the next generation was raised. Would my friend yield? I'd, go ahead, Dennis, no problem. John is recognized. What, I, what, I'm, what I'm trying to understand in what you're saying is, are, are you saying that if a couple is childless, that they're, where do you, where do you put Reclaiming their Reclaiming my their, time. Their, what so I'm where do you saying, put their What I'm saying is, there was an assumption that when a couple was married, there was a high probability that there'd be third and innocent individuals that we wanted to participate and protect. And one of the ways of doing that is to understand that there was a team and not both members may be working, bet, gain benefits and whatever. And that just as we do with the military, where we actually pay um, for spouses to support the spouse, it was based on a whole different assumption. And I'm not getting into this back and forth, but let's just admit that we have moved, and this is not just this is both hetero and homosexual communities have moved so far from the concept of marriage 
that we forget what it was all about. And the only reason why we gave these benefits was because there was assumption that somebody was going to not be working, not getting benefits, and that the, that the, um, that the people taking care of children needed to be supported with, with the child itself. And I know this sounds like an antiquated concept that has been abandoned, but I just think we've just got to remember, we're going to a point now then that we're basically saying, you get married, you're on your own, raising children are no longer going to be, or we're going to go the other way. And it seems like we're just forgetting that this is not about couples. It never was designed to take care of the spouse just because, because the spouse could work too. Why couldn't the, the spouse go work? Because the spouse was assumed to be staying at home watching the children. I know these are dirty things and terrible things to say today, but that is common sense, that's history, that's where we were. Now, where we go from there, we can debate it, but let's not talk about it. That had nothing to do with love, had nothing to do with sex, had nothing to do with uh, all of those personal relationships with two, two people. It came from society's vested interest in the raising of children for the next generation. Mr. You'll Chairman, go. may I? Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, Chair, recognize the gentleman. Thank Missouri, you, Mr. Mr. Clay. Chairman, to speak in favor of the bill and to kind of follow up on what my friend from California was talking about. You know, um, the, the definition on the nucleus of the family has changed dramatically over the last 40 years. Um, I think about our families, uh, members of Congress, uh, how dramatically it has changed. Now, when I grew up, I grew up in a congressional household, and my mom never worked, never had to work. Uh, but, but, and, and she raised the children. Uh, just what you, just, just what Bill Bray is talking about. Uh, but, but now the American family looks a lot different than what it looked like 40 years ago. You may have two parents now of the same sex raising children. Uh, so so it, it's probably we are moving in the right direction with this bill when we when we say let's extend the health care benefits uh, to them to to that family uh, and and it's it, it's more about um, taking care of those children that are part of that family taking care of the of the, the the spouse or the partner whatever you want to call it uh, be, be, because they have put into that family to make it a family no it's not the traditional family that you and I grew up with uh, but it is the American family and 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 that's what we have to come to the realization of that these are this is what the new American family looks like in 2009. Uh, whether you like it or not, that is the reality of this country, uh, and people have a right to that. Uh, so I yield back, Mr. Chair. I thank the gentleman. Uh, if I could just add my own thoughts here. Uh, I, I understand from a historical perspective that indeed uh, the, the scheme of benefits that has been recognized by employers and, and by this government uh, began as a concept of uh, compensating for the disability of the, of the burdens of parenthood. And, uh, and that's how it began many, many, many years ago. However, it has evolved. And I think the gentleman from Ohio was pointing out how in the case of uh, a, a heterosexual couple without children, those benefits flow freely whereas the benefits are denied to same-sex couples uh, facing the same challenges. And I think that's the inequity that this bill tries to address. Uh, if no other members wish to speak, I now call up H.R. 2517. The clerk will read the title of the bill. H.R. 2517, a bill to provide certain benefits to domestic partners of federal employees. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. Hearing no objections, so ordered. All right. I believe I have uh, an amendment in the nature of a substitute at the desk. Uh, the clerk will please designate the amendment. Amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2517, offered by Mr. Lynch of Massachusetts. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read, and I recognize myself for five minutes. 
Uh, the amendment I'm offering this morning for consideration is fairly straightforward in that it takes the original language in the introduced version of H.R. 2517 and, and molds it with the various technical corrections recommended by the Office of Personnel Management at the legislative hearing we held earlier this month. Uh, most of the uh, Office of Personnel Management's technical concerns involve strengthening many of the bill's provisions by ensuring that they were applied correctly to the laws governing all of the benefit programs affected by the bill. The amendment before us does just that by modifying and spelling out throughout the bill all of the various Title V employee spousal benefits that upon passage would be extended to the domestic partners of federal workers. Benefits such as health insurance, retirement and disability benefits, dental and vision benefit, life insurance and long-term care insurance and others. In terms of major policy issues dealt with by the amendment, I'm recommending that the bill be modified to eliminate the ambiguity regarding whether domestic partnership benefits will be afforded to current annuitants or those on the cusp of retirement. Uh, therefore, the amendment before us includes language to specifically apply the bulk of the bill's provisions to retirees, which is consistent with OPM uh, tradition. While the amendment in the nature of a substitute goes a long way in fine-tuning H.R. 2517, and sending a message to thousands of federal employees that the concept of equal pay for equal work should be upheld, I must admit that the bill may possibly have to undergo some additional minor changes going forward as the measure fails to address the inequity in the tax treatment of domestic partner bene benefits, which is not within the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, nevertheless, I hope all members will join me in supporting this amendment, and I now yield to the ranking member uh, for five minutes for any additional comments that he may have on this amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I cannot support this amendment as I do not support the uh, overall bill. You know, what, based on the comments that I heard in the opening statements and some of the arguments that I've heard uh, talk a lot about equality, this bill still fundamentally continues to discriminate. If you are a heterosexual couple who's decided not to marry, you are not going to get the same benefits. It continues to discriminate. I fundamentally do not believe that we should be um, uh, creating benefits like this based on sexual orientation, orientation or lifestyle changes or lifestyle uh, choices. Uh, the exception I obviously make is for the traditional view of, of marriage which is between one man and one woman. I think uh, what is, it is sought in this bill is a recognition uh, from the federal government uh, of these certain lifestyle and uh, orientation choices which I cannot support. I think that's uh, one of the underlying things that's uh, sought in this bill. It looks to, to, to uh, in many ways, redefine marriage, and I will, not, I will not stand for that. We also talk about this huge need, this huge demand in the, in the, in the marketplace that's needed for this. Uh, based on the testimony and arguments that I heard earlier, that this supposedly is only going to affect 0.2% of the workforce, 0.2%. Um, I, I, I have real questions about that because uh, the uh, uh, other side has continually used the numbers in various different directions to their advantage. Sometimes we hear it's 10 to 20 percent. Sometimes we hear it's, you know, based on the scoring, so they can get a low score, 0.2 percent. Um, I, I think there, there are huge question marks in this regard as to what, how, how many people this would affect or not affect. But certainly, I don't think you can make the equality argument, uh, well, they can just simply choose to get married. Well. Um, I, I don't buy that. You, this bill continues to discriminate. Um, I, I want to be as compassionate as we possibly can. I think if the, there was a, a true sincerity about providing uh, benefits to anyone that they may choose, that they would write it as such. That you wouldn't have to be participating as a, as a homosexual or as a lesbian couple. Um, if they were to craft a language that says you could designate anybody, to be your, uh, to receive these benefits, I think there would be a, a, a very different view of this. But because it's based simply on uh, homosexual or lesbian lifestyles, uh, I think we're doing something that is unprecedented and that uh, I simply cannot support. That I'll yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, just in, in, in brief response, the claims of discrimination are inapt, I believe. As the gentleman has acknowledged, in his statement, I think the, the treatment of a, a heterosexual couple, uh, unmarried, uh, can be corrected by the fact of marriage. Uh, that option is not currently available to 
uh, to gay couples. If, if I, would the gentleman yield on that point? Sure. There is a huge and distinct difference between just simply signing a quick affidavit that is just as easily dissolved and what is traditionally done in marriage. The commitment that is made in the states with traditional marriage has much heavier consequences, um, is much more difficult to dissolve than simply just filling out a form and, and dropping it off in the inbox. There is a huge and distinct difference. It is not simply the same. Uh, would, would the gentleman yield or can I be recognized? The gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Uh, I, I want to uh, say to my, uh, to my friend, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, uh, I, uh, I had studied your amendment. The one, you know, it hasn't been offered, but I, but I studied it and I thought about uh, a broader application of, the, of domestic partnership, which is okay with me, really. I mean... The, the, the concern of some members is that uh, the amendment might be seen as a way to, um, uh, to stop the bill, or the period. Uh, I, I don't necessarily, that, that wouldn't change my support for it, but I, 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 think, I think the idea of domestic partnership, every, every uh, same-sex couple, uh, that is, whose benefits would be covered under this, is a domestic partnership. But not every domestic partnership uh, involves same-sex couples. Your, um, the point that you're making is well taken. I, I think we also have to recognize uh, the uh, tremendous amount of discrimination on so many levels that has existed against same-sex couples. It was really, it's really extraordinary to think about it. Anybody, any one of us who, who knows uh, people who are in a committed relationship and they have to be, happen to be of the same sex. Um, one case, two very dear friends of my wife and I have been in a committed relationship for over 40 years. And, and looking at the trajectory of that relationship and where it started, what people had to go through, the kind of, uh, of prejudice and the, um, the, the, and on the other hand, the kind of courage it took to live an authentic life, is, is something I think is recognized in, in this amendment. But, I, I, but I, I don't think that we should discount the concerns that Mr. Chaffetz has expressed here about a broader application of uh, the idea of a domestic partnership. Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bilbray. The gentleman recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Bilbray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as uh, is so often true to a point of being scary, uh, the, the former uh, mayor of uh, Cleveland and I agree pretty closely on this item. I think that if the new definition of couple has evolved to a point. Um, I know that there is also prejudice against um, heterosexual relations um, that are not married trying to get rentals and you get into those issues. There are, there are you know, prejudice from, from perceptions both ways, but granted it's not balanced. But the point being here is this piece of legislation, is it going to perpetuate and um, other um, discriminate, discrimination or other prejudices, or is it just going to address, address um, is it going to address it across it? And basically said, we have now moved beyond the, the traditional family or couple definition and will now apply it. Because the same thing can be said about the fact that what about a couple that for religious reasons don't get married, that feel that the entire institution of marriage, they may be heterosexual, um, have heterosexual relationships, but they don't do not support the traditional institutions and think and, and oppose the traditional institutions on the same side is the fact that this this relationship going and I I just got to say that if you're going to say the benefit should be provided to anybody um, with a with a committed relationship um, 
then how the heck do you say, make it conditional on, on orientation? You know, how do you justify that? Except you're saying this bill really is meant only for this one group and we won't allow anybody else um, the same op opportunity. So I think the best way to be able to really um, execute what is, what is claimed to be intended with this bill is to eliminate the condition that they have to be same sex, eliminate those conditioning clauses, and say, look, anybody that falls into this category, regardless of their, their uh, gender, can participate in the program. That's the way you make this bill truly broad, pr truly inclusion, inclusionary, and not hide a targeted piece of legislation under the general concept of not discriminate. And I yield back. And I, will, I plan on introducing that amendment um, for that reason. Mr. Chairman. Okay, let me, let me just, uh, uh, claiming some time here, let me just point out, the gentleman is saying that uh, men and women uh, excuse me, heterosexual couples are, are somehow being discriminated against because, of, because their situation does not grant benefits. Let me just point out that under common law arrangements, uh, the Office of Personnel Management does recognize common law marriage. So that those people are indeed recognized. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, there are many, sta many, many, many states that do not recognize Well, we're talking law. about federal employees here. We're talking about federal employees and the Office of Personal, Personnel Management for federal employees recognizes common law marriage. So it basically defeats the gentleman's argument. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I have a question for the gentleman because the two gentlemen on the other side um, appear to be in, in disagreement. The gentleman from Utah uh, emphasizes marriage and the difference between marriage and a mere affidavit. Um, does that mean that the gentleman would support this bill in those states where, in fact, couples may be married, and there are now maybe almost half a dozen states which recognize same-sex marriage, which would therefore meet uh, your apparent criterion of a committed relationship because they are married under the law of the state? Probably not, no. Well, I think that points out that that is not the difference here then, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. I'm the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Northern Virginia. I thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I, I, again, I, I can respect the sensibilities of our colleagues uh, with respect to the subject, but with due respect, it's not relevant. How one feels personally about same-sex relationships or marriage is not what's in front of us. What's in front of us is a piece of legislation to allow those who are living uh, in a partnership relationship of the same sex uh, to be able to access benefits like any other federal employee. And uh, will the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield? Will the gentleman yield on that point? If I may finish, irrespective of one's personal moral view of how the world ought to work, that's not the question in front of us. Unless what we're about is trying to make political points, it's a piece of legislation to, in fact, address a piece of discrimination we ought to be uncomfortable with as a Congress. And as the chairman has indicated, this is about the federal workforce not some other workforce, the one we control, the one we have to address. And, I, I, you know, we've heard so many comments here that really get at, I'm uncomfortable about that. Um, and I find, uh, as I've said before, a, a monumental contradiction that somebody would say, I'm concerned that this legislation, perhaps unintentionally, actually discriminates against heterosexuals. Um, I'm so grateful to hear the concern about discrimination, uh, but I don't hear it followed through in consistent logic. Uh, this is designed, this legislation is designed to right a wrong and to recognize the 21st century reality for what it is in the federal workforce, irrespective of our personal moral views. And I would hope the subcommittee would proceed accordingly. Would Thank the gentleman you, Mr. Yield Chairman. to the. No, I'll give you 
Chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah. It, to suggest that it's the same for each and every person, I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, it is simply not true. W with all due respect, there are, there are people in many different categories. And what we're doing is essentially creating another, another new class, but still not including everyone. And that's what I'm saying is duplicitous in this, in this discussion is, you know, I, before when we had the hearing, one of the examples that I used is uh, my, my great aunt. Now, she wasn't a federal employee, but just for the sake of the discussion, let's pretend that she was a federal employee. When her husband passed away, it was a very sad time for her. It was very difficult for her. Um, and she ended up living with another woman. It had nothing to do with sexual orientation or intimacy. It had everything to do with safety and security, with a, the need to maybe share an apartment and that sort of thing. But that, to, to suggest that it is something that is available to absolutely everybody, is, it, it's just not true. The other thing that I think we also haven't discussed in any of these, any of these discussions is just the sheer cost at a time when we're $12 trillion in debt, paying $600 million a day in interest to offer new benefits and expand that benefit pool is something that's troubling. But specific to what the gentleman uh, from Virginia said, um, I, I, I just take issue with, the, with it because it still perpetuates and creates and inequality based on the definitions that I've heard from the other side thus far. Thank you. If there are no other individuals wishing to, uh, oh, yes. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter. Uh, I have uh, two different angles here. One is, is that um, whatever your view is, is to try to say that I or others take my position to try to score political points is just not true. Uh, I have had and uh, will continue to have deeply held moral views uh, that actually uh, are not politically correct in many cases, and it's, it's not necessarily comfortable to always advocate that, and I do not raise these things in my uh, elections. And in fact, the Democrats ran a national ad against me claiming that I was friends with Mark Foley who had unnatural sex with minors. So I'm not about to get a bunch of moral lectures from Democrats about how I, how I use politics in this. I have deeply held views. And the, the view that you can't, um, that you can fund domestic partners uh, benefits is a moral view in itself. You believe that uh, that's your moral view. And it's not just to ask me to check my moral views that traditional uh, Christians have to check their views at the door and can't be governed by it while you're governed by your views, namely that equality over that trumps a moral, uh, a traditional moral view. That's your moral view. And now more directly to the point here um, uh, in the uh, discussion about uh, Mr. Bilbray's amendment, I would oppose his amendment and, and will do so. And uh, uh, whether or not it, uh, I, I find myself a little confused as to whether federal uh, uh, heterosexual employees are covered with their certificate, but more on a basic principle. Because like it or not, heterosexual co couples can get a marriage certificate and they choose not to. Homosexual couples overall are banned from getting a marriage certificate. The reason we're having to deal with this is because they aren't. So the fact is, is that they are uh, more discriminated against than heterosexual couples. So ironically, uh, in this case, while I understand my uh, friend from California's point, I don't agree with it. Thank the gentleman. If no other members wish to speak on this amendment, the question is now on the Lynch Amendment and the nature of a substitute. All those in favor signify, signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it Mr. and the chairman. amendment is adopted. Mr. Chairman, I ask for a recorded vote, please. A recorded vote having been requested, the clerk will read the roll. Mr. Lynch. Yes. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Ms. Norton. Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Clay. Mr. Clay votes aye. Mr. Conley. Aye. Mr. Conley votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. No. Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. Souter. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Bilbray votes no. The clerk will report the roll. There are five ayes and three noes. 
The ayes have it, and the amendment is adopted. Mr. Mr. Chair. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2517 offered by Mr. Bill Bray of California. Page 2, lines 10 to 11, strike of the same sex. Page 3, line 9, insert and after the semicolon. Page 3, line 11, strike and. Page 3, strike lines 12 through 15. Chair, recognize the gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, the amendment's very clear cut. It um, strikes the of the same sex, and it basically reflects, as has been articulated before, the brave new world we've entered into, this new definition of couples, relationships, um, and it eliminates the uh, discriminatory um, uh, clause within the existing bill. Um, the fact is, is that if uh, the, gen the gentleman uh, 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 brought up this issue about couples may have choices. There are different choices in different states. Uh, his state may have one. Mine may have another. Um, the uh, Utah may have another. May maybe New Hampshire and, and uh, Massachusetts. You don't know what California is going to be next year. My uh, bill basically eliminates that question, uh, directs it to the fact that everyone, no matter what their gender, will be treated equally under this bill and makes it appropriate. Now, if, if in fact the chairman's argument is that, that everyone else already has this option, so why do we have to bring it? My question is, then what's the damage of reaffirming that they have that option? And so I, I introduced this bill as, as a way to be able to eliminate se the segment that may be perceived as being discriminatory and um, t transform the bill into inclusionary. So I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, climbing uh, a few minutes on this, the effect of the gentleman's amendment would basically extend benefits between every federal employee and every person with which the, that person had a relationship. Now, it doesn't indicate any particular relationship. It could be a cousin, a brother, a teammate, somebody in the carpool, if he could establish that there was a relationship, any relationship between the employee and that other person, uh, then benefits would be extended. The, the floodgates problem and the cost problem with this and the, uh, the management aspects of, of uh, this amendment uh, I just uh, mind-boggling, and uh, I understand Mr. the gentleman Chairman, wishes you, to make a point. Let me just finish, and we'll, each member will have adequate time to, to address this. Uh, but to establish uh, benefits on the basis of any any relationship at all uh, is. Uh, I understand the gentleman wishes to make a point, but the facility of this is. Uh, is confounding. Uh, I yield back. To answer that, first of all, you still have the committed relationship. And it's not a point. It's the fact that let's not bring this back five years from now and say, well, we've, mo we've gone this far. It's time that we finally finish it off and make it a, a universal option. The fact is that there are different types of committed relationships. I live with my mother. I admit it. I'm, you know, I'm 58 years old. I'm, to, you know, the family's taking care of my mother. There is a lot, there is a long-term relationship and commitment there. The fact is, is that there's different types of committed relationships. But if you are saying now that dollars and cents is what matters, then we get back to the a whole different argument. That I thought this was about being inclusionary, not discriminating, then let's do it. Let's, let's actually allow it to be done and let's not pick and choose winners and losers on this item. Anybody else wish to be heard on this amendment? Chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington, D.C. You mean the gentlelady? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm a gentlewoman. Oh, what did I say? Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's all right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Talk here. Chair recognizes. 
but the gentle lady <laughs> from the District of Columbia, the Swamp Norton. The room is Norton. full of gentlemen, so the chairman is, is forgiven. Um, uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Bilbray, offers a radical amendment, otherwise known as a poison pill. Uh, this bill, on the other hand, far from radical, is trying to catch up with the rest of the country, certainly with large corporations, and if you will look at the polls on where people stand on the rights of, uh, of same-sex couples and the rights of homosexuals, you will see that we're just catching up uh, with the rest of the country. Uh, we're not asking the federal government to take a great leap in, into the unknown. So I say to the gentleman on the other side, if you're against the bill, uh, the honorable way to respond is to vote against the bill, not to try to insert a poison pill in the bill, which you know will be Would the defeated. gentlelady yield on yes, that sir. point? I intend, if this amendment is passed, to support the bill. Yeah, and that's why it's a poison pill, because you know it won't pass, reclaiming my time, and I yield back the, the rest of my time. The gentlewoman yield. Uh, Chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah. Uh, so far, I haven't heard a substantive argument against it, other than a, the throwing some names at it, poison pill, it could never pass. This, the same definitions that we had used for homosexual and lesbian couples uh, still apply. For instance, you know, common residence, uh, responsibility, those types of, of requirements are still in this bill. What we're trying to say is if you truly want to create equality, then let's not base it solely on lifestyle and sexual orientation. There are many cases, and we could be here for weeks, coming up with scenarios where you have people who are in a committed relationship but maybe aren't participating at the intimate uh, uh, level, something that is impossible for the federal government, nor should the federal government be in involved in trying to de decipher and decide and, and investigate and enforce. Um, this, this amendment, which uh, Mr. Bilbray is bringing forward, makes a lot of sense. If you want to actually designate an additional person to participate as a beneficiary, and you're truly, truly about equality, and you want it to be the same for everyone, then you, I think, have to vote for this amendment. Because if you're rejecting it, you're saying, no, 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 no. I just want to do this for somebody who is practicing, uh, 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 making a lifestyle choice. It's not the moral issue, but what we are saying is, yeah, you can designate somebody. There are ramifications. We fill out some paperwork to, to get into it, it and uh, you have to meet certain requirements, and you fill out a piece of paper and, and when you dissolve it. But uh, I would like to hear a substantive argument from the other side as to why, because every Every homosexual and lesbian couple would be included in this if they meet the requirements, as is the underlying bill, but would also open it up to others who maybe don't practice those lifestyle choices. And I think that is truly more fair, more equitable, and, and more of a, a balanced playing field, if you will, and gets towards the equality uh, that Mr. Bilbray talked about. With that, I yield. Mr. Chairman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Northern Virginia. Um, I guess, once again, I, I hear a monumental contradiction in my friend's logic. Uh, he initially told us this made him uncomfortable, uh, that he believed the definition of marriage was between a man and a woman. Now he's telling us he's concerned about discrimination and that he could support this amendment, which actually would, if passed, provide benefits to same-sex couples, something he earlier told us he opposed. And we heard him lecture us about consistency about discrimination. Well, if you really want to be that consistent about discrimination, then I assume you favor repeal of the Defense of Marriage Act because it discriminates. And I assume that you would in fact favor the movement in the United States to recognize same-sex marriages because it discriminates. And you're against that. The I yield back to, to that. you, Mr. Chairman. Let me just, I'm going to have them designate the amendment so that we can take this up in order, okay? Will the clerk please designate the amendment? 
Mr. Bilbray's amendment? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2517 offered by Mr. Bilbray of California. I ask unanimous consent that the amendment be considered as read. Without objection, the amendment is considered as read. And I now recognize uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Bilbray. Mr. Chairman, I, I need to apologize to the committee. I should have explained that my history related to the entire issue of discrimination. Um, some of you may not know, I was the author in the 90s of the Workplace Fairness Act. Um, the Workplace Fairness Act was a concept that rather than picking certain groups to be protected, we said that unless it directly related to workplace, unless it directly related to work performance, no discrimination should be justified or should be legal. That was the Workplace Fairness Act. I know a lot of people in this town hated my bill because it didn't target certain groups and didn't, uh, you know, cr create certain, certain packages that people were comfortable with. But it was a feeling that we, if we're going to say that discrimination is bad, then it should be no matter what group, if it had a political power in D.C. or not, was going to be able to be protected in this. And why not use this momentum to address everyone on the line. This amendment is just basically trying to say the same thing. And so I'm just saying in the spirit of the Workplace Protection Act, I'm just saying is, is that um, uh, why not, why condition who qualifies for this when in fact we know somebody is out there is going to be end up being hit. We know it's not going to be um, something we'll ignore 5, 10, 15 years from now. Why not address it now and why pick only one group or one, um, one segment of society rather than sending the more general view, which I think is much more defensible, that it's, this isn't just for one group, this is for everybody. Now yield back. Okay. Uh, gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter is recognized. We, we've been having kind of like uh, two parallel uh, debates. Uh, the, the basic fundamental question is modification of uh, the traditional definition of, of marriage and giving access to those rights to those who don't have the opportunity to uh, be recognized as having a uh, marriage. Mr. Brobray has raised a second point, which is um, uh, really why do we have that kind of, of uh, um, law? Why did we have things all through our code that uh, discriminate on the basis of families? Uh, and the part of it was economic, and part of it was a goal to create the economic uh, reason, uh, or to uh, at least help compensate for those who chose uh, that lifestyle. Now, uh, so we have one debate, uh, that, which is why I would uh, oppose Mr. Bilbray's amendment, because I believe that the fundamental debate here is over marriage, and in fact, uh, that uh, I don't believe, contrary to the implied statement, that any state bans heterosexual marriage, uh, or ever will ban heterosexual marriage, uh, that therefore heterosexuals are in a, a totally different situation than uh, homosexuals. Now, the, uh, if we move to legislation that says that it isn't uh, a definition of marriage, and in rather just a caring relationship, then uh, it's an interesting debate. I don't believe we should move that direction. One last point. Um, discrimination can mean meanness, it can mean uh, nastiness, it can mean second class and all this type of thing, but the fact is we discriminate all the time in law. If we say there can be no discrimination, why should not anything be called a church? We have definitions for church. Why should small business get benefits over a big business? It's because society has said this is a value that we want to promote. So we give tax breaks to religious institutions. We give tax breaks to small business over big business. And the fundamental debate here, and it's a legitimate debate, which, which many uh, Americans uh, don't accept the traditional position anymore, that there should be a benefit given to traditional marriage. I haven't shied away from that uh, fundamental debate. And to me, that's the fundamental issue here, because indeed, this is a whole different bill if we're debating that this is a caregiver bill for home care for moms, uh, if you have foster kids in your house, uh, if you are two, a brother and sister living together, that's a whole different debate, really, than the definition of marriage. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. <clears throat> While I certainly understand uh, the, 
the argument that the gentleman has put forward. Uh, I must oppose the amendment at hand for a number of reasons, and uh, cost, interestingly, is just one of, of the reasons why I certainly understand that the language would essentially extend domestic uh, partnership benefits to both same-sex and opposite-sex couples. Uh, I think the amendment goes further than that by recognizing any commitment, any committed relationship between a federal worker and any other individual. It uh, exponentially expands the number of people who are eligible for benefits on, under the plan. Uh, in addition, opposite-sex couples already have access to complete family benefits under federal law. Uh, to gain access to these benefits, one avenue would be for uh, heterosexual couples to marry. The other recognition at OPM for federal employees, to which this bill applies, uh, heterosexual couples uh, living in common law marriage are also recognized. Uh, marriage is only available to same-sex couples in six states, and even if they do legally marry, they still do not have access to federal civilian employment benefits such as health care and retirement benefits for their families. Uh, the gentleman's amendment is not about fairness or even about giving opposite-sex couples a new manner of securing family benefits. It is essentially altering the original intent of this bill, which is to extend benefits to individuals who have been denied such simply because of their sexual orientation. Therein lies the real constitutional issue at hand. Lastly, the amendment is unnecessary, again, of course, uh, unless the gentleman believes that marriage is an undue burden upon opposite-sex couples who want family benefits. So again, I thank the gentleman for his engagement, but I urge opposition to this amendment. Do any other members wish to speak on the gentleman's amendment? If no other members wishes to speak on the amendment, the question is now on the Bill Bray Amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say no. 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 In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it and the amendment is not adopted. Mr. Chairman. The uh, gentleman the, is recognized. I'm not going to uh, call a vote. I'm just going to say, look, I didn't come here with an agenda. I didn't even come here with an intent to make an amendment. It's just as the discussion developed, it became obvious to me that, that, that the effort should be made, and I appreciate the, the ability to uh, dialogue on this item. I understand, and I, I, I thank the gentleman. I now move that the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service, and the District of Columbia report H.R. 2517 as amended to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform with the recommendation that the bill does pass. The question is on favorably reporting H.R. 2517 to the Committee on Oversight and Government Fro Reform. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes Mr. have Chairman. it and the motion Mr. is agreed to. I ask for a recorded vote. A recorded vote has been requested. The Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Lynch. Aye. Mr. Lynch votes aye. Ms. Norton. Aye. Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Davis. Mr. Cummings. Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Clay. Aye. Mr. Clay votes aye. Mr. Conley. Aye. Mr. Conley votes aye. Mr. Chaffetz. No. Mr. Chaffetz votes no. Mr. McHugh. Mr. Souter. No. Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Bilbray. No. Mr. Bill Bray votes no. Will the clerk report the roll? On that vote, sir, there are five ayes and three noes. The amendment is therefore adopted. Uh, I'm sorry. The bill as amendment is adopted. Uh, the, this concludes our business. For today, I ask unanimous consent that the staff be authorized to make technical and conforming changes to all matters ordered, reported without objection, so ordered. The committee stands adjourned.